We're here to announce the launch of our new patient care program and the first grant under that program, $9 million to John Hopkins University. We've uh, spent the past year working very hard at designing this new program and preparing it for today's launch. And we're fully aware of the significant challenges and risk, but at the same time, we're also quite inspired by the results that we are prepared to, to commit half a billion dollars over the next 10 years. We also realize that the size of the problem well exceeds that ability, the ability of us, even at that level, to bring about the kind of changes we'd like to see. And so we're really positioning the foundation as a change maker, not just simply a grant maker. We want to deploy our voice, our connections, our ability to bring together diverse groups, and our dedication to working with other funders to engage in collective action and collective impact. Through its research, the foundation identified three aspects of patient care in the United States that need significant improvement. Everyone recognizes the first two, quality and safety, and the cost of health care. And many of you are deeply committed to addressing those aspects. However, the foundation believes that just as important is engaging patients and families in their own health care. And when we say patients, we mean any consumer of health care. When activated, patients have improved health outcomes across a variety of medical conditions. And when well-informed and engaged in shared decision-making, patients will choose care that is usually less invasive and less costly. But if so many patients are willing and able to engage in their own health care, why aren't they? I think we all know the answer. Because too often we in healthcare are not supportive of such engagement. Many of you here today, even clinicians such as myself, we know that when we find ourselves as patients facing the healthcare system, our confidence ebbs as though we become a different person. We are afraid that not only could we be hurt by the complexity and urgency of healthcare, but also if we speak up, we'll be labeled a difficult patient even if it means that we expose ourselves to physical harm, unnecessary anxiety, and to silent indignity. We in healthcare need to stop harming patients. We must eliminate all preventable harms, not only medical harms, but also the harm of receiving excessive, inappropriate care, and the harm of losing the dignity and respect of one's personhood. That, too, is a measurable harm to be eliminated. When we take away a patient's dignity and respect, even unintentionally, we take our own away, too. Therefore, the Foundation has developed the program's theory of change. Improvements in patient care will be more significant, efficient, and durable by focusing on and meaningfully engaging patients and families in their own health care tightly linked to a supportive health care delivery system. I want to emphasize that a supportive health care delivery system does not hurt patients. It prevents avoidable complications and errors. It prevents unnecessary, wasteful, and disrespectful care, and it will reduce health care costs. What can we do to realize that vision? What must we do? First, create the systems a care that stops harming patients. A system cannot be supportive if it hurts patients. It must be safe. The foundation believes that patients should not have to rely on the heroism of individual committed healthcare professionals, often working in chaotic environments. And patients and families must be part of that redesign so that the delivery system not only meets the needs of healthcare professionals to provide the highest levels of quality and safety, but also ensures that the care is delivered in a way that enhances the respect and dignity of patients and families. Second, we do everything we can to welcome 
and support the engagement of patients and their families in their own health care. Patients and families want and need to be engaged. We must embrace that opportunity. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation believes in taking big risks for the goal of achieving big impact. And the Foundation believes in collaborating with others. We want to build on and expand the work of so many dedicated individual and organizations to achieve what we all so fiercely desire, safe, affordable, compassionate care. As our first step toward that ambitious goal, we will begin in the acute care setting. Hence, we are pleased to announce a grant in strategic partnership with the Johns Hopkins Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety Other and Other industries rely much less on heroism from individuals and more on designing safe systems. They use technologies to support work. For a pilot, a plane's cockpit today is much simpler than it was 30 years ago, even though the planes are infinitely more complicated. The cockpit display is not. And by integrating technologies, it is far, far safer. Not so in healthcare. This new program, made possible by the generosity and the vision of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, is about to change this. It's daunting. The Foundation's new program will ensure that patients and their families are meaningfully engaged as part of the healthcare team. And we will design a healthcare system that works to eliminate all harms and that it will learn and improve. And most importantly, it will be accountable for the results it produces. We will produce a model in the ICU. The product will form a little mini Bell Labs, drawing upon the full richness of our university, bringing together an amazing and diverse team from the Johns Hopkins schools of medicine and nursing, public health, engineering, business, the Berman Ethics Institute, and importantly, the applied physics lab where Gordon Moore once worked. And we're delighted to have the University of California, San Francisco as our initial partner on this work. While this work builds upon prior improvement efforts, it differs in two fundamental ways. First, it defines patient harm from a lack of dignity and respect as a harm that is every bit as real and important as an infection. Second, it works to, work, it works to reduce all harms starting with goals and then working backwards to design the kind of care patients deserve. We've built a lot of tools to help systems figure out how to recreate, re-envision a sense of shared roles, a sense of shared responsibilities, new sense of accountability, built uh, the kinds of quality monitoring and quality improvement systems that need to change the way that we structure our relationships with patients and families. But it is a path. It's not a completed journey. And so we are tremendously excited that the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation has embarked on a vision that will help accelerate all of the work of so many here um, and so many throughout the country and the globe to dramatically think about a re-envisioned care system where patients and families are front and center. That path forward begins for us. Um, and I am the great fortune to be a part of the National Advisory Group for this program, begins today, renews ourselves again today in a conversation with many extraordinary people who will share what it is that they think this kind of opportunity can bring. So let us begin where we should, with the patient's perspective on this program. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nicole James. I have sickle cell anemia, 37 years old. Sickle cell is a hereditary blood disorder. It causes red blood cells, which are normally round, to be shaped like a sickle, and they carry less, blood, less oxygen throughout the body. As a sickle cell anemic, I experience episodes that are called pain crises, and it can range, it's excruciating pain that can range from a single joint throughout your, or your entire body. In 2008, I had a pain crisis that carried me to the hospital, and it took me a little bit to be treated, but after I was, I responded really well to, medic, to the pain meds that I received and the IV fluids. I was up, walking around, joking with family like I, I usually do, 
And I thought that I was going to be out of there in a day or so. In the background, my doctor that was treating me uh, read my x-ray, my chest x-ray, and he diagnosed me with pneumonia. He proceeded to treat me for the pneumonia without having any discussion with me. Unfortunately, I responded negatively to the medication, and I ended up um, going back into crisis, one that was worse than the one that I originally came in to be treated for. If he had chosen to actually speak with me, he would have learned that I have scar tissue on my lungs. And what he was looking at wasn't actually a pneumonia. So what, turned, what could have been a day or so in the hospital ended up being two weeks in the hospital. And it, takes me, it took me, I mean, it, it just increases your cost, my cost for being in there in the first place. It increased the cost of my insurance company. And it takes me away from my life, what I, the things I like to do and the things that I value. So it's really scary. You don't like to think about it on a daily basis, but the truth is that every single time I go to the hospital, there is a chance that I'm not coming out. And you never want that to happen. So I'm really, really thrilled to be a part of this today. I'm thrilled to know that there is a program like this. And for patients everywhere, I'd like to say a huge thank you. Thank you for hearing us, thank you for caring, and thank you for I, I, It's friends. terrific what the, what the foundation is doing, and I think the time is right. There's more attention being given to healthcare than ever before, and I really like the goal that uh, both that you and, uh, and, and Steve both articulated of to eliminate all preventable patient harm. And I like the fact, um, Steve, when you let off, you're saying um, be ambitious, uh, be transformative, and I think there's a real opportunity to do it. Healthcare is changing, the delivery system is changing. Uh, providers need to pay attention to what um, patients are doing and saying, uh, and pay attention to what those numbers that I uh, mentioned have to, have to do. Um, so in terms of the communication, can talk more about it later, but th there's, there's a tendency to think uh, those who deal with this in the medical field, you know, I know what patients want. They don't. Uh, you said don't, don't, <laughs> don't presume and sure. Yeah. You don't know what patients want unless you really, truly ask and listen, and listen with an open mind. You know, in some ways, it's almost as simple as that. I don't want to yeah. overstate it, but yeah. the notion of really paying attention and listening without preconceived notions, and also to realize that all patients are different. You can't categorize by demographics or ethnicity or anything else like that. Every patient is different and needs to be listened to. Uh, my optimism is that I think with what people in the room are doing here, with what the foundation is doing, uh, there really is the the opportunity, and I'm going to say I think you're going to achieve success. We will achieve success eventually on it, and I really applaud the foundation, by the way, in seeking out the consumer perspective, because all too often uh, folks in the medical field say, yes, of course, the patient comes first, assume what the patient wants, and don't really get the consumer perspective, and that's one thing the foundation so The is things doing. that I'm most excited I'm about, about this program, are really, first, the idea of the big tent the idea that we have to collaborate and work together. The second, this idea of design, the engineering disciplines. To it, why should you have to be heroic to make it happen? Why doesn't it just happen automatically? And the third is the idea of innovation. We need this kind of innovation to apply the best minds, technology, to basically, in a nutshell, have the care delivered to us, to us as patients, to our families, that we would like the kind that Nicole deserves, the kind of thing that would prevent in the future from anyone having to go through what she went through. So again, I'm thrilled, excited, I applaud the foundation, and I'm privileged to have been part of the advisory. And I congratulate the foundation, and I thank them for their commitment to not getting rid of most of the infections, or not some curve on the infections, or not some preventable harm someday but all preventable harm is your objective and your approach of taking a systems view with a focus on patients and family is extraordinary. I was really 
uh, blown away in George's introduction by language around dignity and respect. And you reinforce this, this sense of who I am, my uniqueness as a human being. And I, I'm wondering if you could uh, uh, share some of the ways in which those of us on the clinical teams uh, could be more responsive to that, could really leave you at the end of each encounter with a sense that you are the most respected person um, that we are meeting today. I would say to ask questions. Um, when I got to Hopkins, the first doctor that I did meet with there, we sat down and had a conversation about who I am and what I, what I do um, and, the, and the history of my medical background um, before we even got to treatment. And finding out what my goals are, what's important to me, what I value, and giving me permission to speak and letting me know that you want to hear what I have to say is very important, and all that takes is the Bring ask. people in, especially those who've had a problem. Uh, in industry, they talk about the dissatisfied customer is your best source of information for how to, how to improve. And then I'm thinking kind of in a systemic way. Some of you may be aware that um, uh, the last couple of years, most, re most recently in August, Consumer Reports uh, put out hospital ratings. I think we had something in the neighborhood of 1,500, 2,000 hospitals, maybe even more than that. And it had to do with, among other things, patient engagement, medical, uh, uh, hospital acquired infections and so forth. And what we've learned, several hospitals have come to us, and you've had some experience also, Peter, you talked about. Um, we put the ratings out to help consumers make choices, but I think the real impact is a hospital doesn't want to be at the low end of those ratings and a board of directors or trustees of a hospital is, it doesn't want to have the hospital in that way. And so I think this whole notion of being transparent, not only transparent in the individual conversation, but transparent on how an institution is doing can have a profound impact. Uh, how do we get a new workforce prepared for this? Well, I think you're right. I think it is a cultural uh, transformation, and yet I'm very optimistic because if you actually talk to nurses and doctors about what it is they want to do, they want to deliver the care that works for the patient. But they, and the, Peter made this point in his remarks. But they themselves are under constraints, pressures, and things from, frankly, poorly designed systems, whether these are the operational systems in hospitals or even the organization and financing system broadly in healthcare. So, um, all of this is going to require a cultural transformation. And what we see today is well-meaning clinicians working in poorly designed systems, how they feel is they feel like they don't have time to really engage with the patient and the family, but really they don't have time not to if they really want to achieve the kinds of goals. But we can't just exhort them to do it. We really have to engineer the system that makes it easy for them to do it and makes it easy for the patients and families to engage as care. well. Mary, One of the things that Betty Moore told us is she said, I want all of you, speaking to the people who are taking care, I want all of you to work together. I don't want to talk to a nurse and then talk to another nurse who doesn't know what the other nurse is talking about, who doesn't know what the doctor is. Now that seems just imminently reasonable. So we are working with others to develop the sense of interprofessional team-based care, both at the level of um, education, as, as Mike had described, graduate medical education, even before going into medical school. That's one of the things that University of California Davis School of Nursing is developing as interprofessional team-based care, but also in practice. And I'm glad that Joe Selby of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute is here because there's a lot of research that needs to be done and will be done in understanding how do we address research questions around interprofessional team-based care. I think it goes back to what Mike was saying and what Nicole has said. Keep clear what it is that we want. We do not want to hurt patients, whether it's bodily harm, a loss of dignity and respect. Second, give me feedback that I can understand and that I can take action on. Don't feed me data I don't understand. Help me understand what I need to do, and if need be, help me use the words. 
Help me use the phrases. Help me be a better nurse, pharmacist, x-ray technician, whoever it is. We are so dedicated, those of us in healthcare. We want to do the very best. Help us learn. And I think it begins with that. Both the humility of I want to learn and the respect of I will help you learn. Highlight is Steve McCormick had described the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation. We are all about transformation and having collective impact. And the way that we intend to have collective impact in all of our programs, but especially in the patient care program, is to design systems as a coherent, optimally designed system so that rapidity of innovation is a reality as it is everywhere else. Remember the co-founder of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, Gordon Moore, innovation rapidly at scale.